PC Keith Palmer, uh, the police officer who lost his life in the line of duty today. Um, a husband and father as described by the uh, Assistant Deputy Commissioner and of course uh, the force wanting to pay tribute uh, to him for his sacrifice. For his Something that you never expect to hear anywhere, let alone in Parliament, is the... sound of high velocity gunshots which just caused understandable panic and mayhem and people trying to disperse everywhere not sure quite what to do and I found myself uh, in that area where the incident was unfolding and immediately realized the police that we work with every day in and out that part of our community or our friends had moved into operational mode and there was a gun line of, of over 30 guns I think all pointing towards uh, the carriage gates where the incident was uh, defending us and that's what their job was and huge and huge and huge uh, respect to all police officers up down the coast they don't know how their day is going to unfold and they go to work and they just get on with it as life goes on the next day parliament did sit we weren't going to stop And likewise, these activities, these terrorist attacks take place designing to try to rip our communities apart. Mm -hmm. And they do the opposite. They make us stronger. They make us more determined to say we're going to stand up to this sort of thing in the future. It was bizarre, though, in the sense that we hoped, thought, believed it was a one-off. It was the beginning of a series of terrorist attacks that it's now uh, sort of extraordinary to look back on. Because a few weeks later, there was the attack on Manchester yeah. Arena at the Ariana Grande concert, then there was the attack at London Bridge, mm. and then there was the attack at Finsbury Park. And like that, he's gone. Are we safer now? I mean, a year's reflection is there were more terrorist attacks, as we know, the Grenfell and so forth. There were more terrorist attacks, as we know, the Grenfell and so forth. 
Grenfell and so forth. I think, well, go back to when I first was made aware of terrorism as such with the loss of my brother in 2002. Go back to when I first was made aware of terrorism as such with the loss of my brother in 2002. You know, that was a long in time the Bali ago. Bombings. 15 years ago, and today these attacks are still taking place. And so, when, if you ask that question. Gentlemen, the lies we're inflicted with in the 21st century, the war on terror to me is the ultimate one. How can you have a war on terror? What are you talking about? This doesn't even make sense. When's this going to end? When they've got the terror. Relax, it's all gone. <laughs> We're moving on to horror next. <laughs> this is insanity. You can't have a war on terror. You're having a war on terror, are you? That's right. What does war create? Uh. <laughs> terror. Exactly. So you're having a war against the consequence of the actions you're involved in. Ours is good terror. <laughs> it's good, peace, freedom, loving terror. You know. Bats. We're at a pivotal moment that we're heading towards today. Do we just look after ourselves and defend ourselves? Or do we go and see where things are going wrong? Because al-Shabaab or Boko Haram or al-Nusra or al-Qaeda, all these flourish where there isn't any governance. If you just look at the last few years, British policy, what Britain and its allies have done to Libya, to Syria, have turned these places into havens for death squads and militias that are terrorizing the entire region. The, think of the, the millions of people that have been traumatized as a result of, of Britain's actions in Libya, turning a prosperous uh, state, the, the most prosperous and, and advanced and, and with the highest living standards in all of Africa, turning that state into a failed state uh, that's a haven for militias, opening up its arsenal to all the death squads and militias of the whole region to terrorize the people of not only Libya, but Algeria, mm. uh, Cameroon, Nigeria, Tunisia, Egypt. The millions of traumatized peoples as a result of just this one act of aggression by, by Britain. And we know Britain routinely dishes out this kind of aggression. I think regroup on this and work with our allies. We're sitting down with Michael Scheuer, the man who had served in the CIA for more than 20 years, up until 2004. At one time, he was the chief of the CIA bin Laden unit. Then he went and exposed how counter-effective Washington's methods were in the fight against terror. I'm very pleased to have the chance to interview you, Thank Mr. You. Scheuer. I'm glad to be here. Bin Laden is gone. Who is Washington's number one enemy now? Washington's enemy is an enemy that doesn't exist. We're fighting an, uh, an Islamic enemy that uh, Washington believes is out to kill us because we have elections, because we're free, because we have women in the workplace. It's an enemy that doesn't exist. It didn't exist when bin Laden was alive. It doesn't exist now. I'm um, a minister in the Foreign Office, and I spend much of my time looking after the Middle East and Africa. And there, one of the major challenges we have is dealing with extremism, is dealing with poisonous ideology of the religion of Islam being hijacked and extremists providing a promise to youngsters who don't really understand the religion and offering them a fast track. To paradise, if they conduct themselves in the extreme way that we see. America is being attacked because of its foreign policy in the, in the Muslim world, because of its support for Israel, because of its support for the Saudi police state, because of its presence on the Arab Peninsula. And until we accept that, until Americans can say to each other, whether you support aid to Israel or not, 
our relationship with Israel is causing this war, we are not going to be able to, to, to defeat this enemy. Uh, how many times have we heard Mr. Clinton, Mr. Bush, Mr. Obama say, th this has nothing to do with religion, this is not a religious war, this is a bunch of people who are just madmen. We are definitely fighting a religious war. And until we come to realize that, we are never going to be able to defeat it. In fact, we're, we're encouraging the growth of a, next, of a new generation of people who are going to fight us. The US. And I work very hard with our international allies on trying to understand this new threat, this asymmetric warfare that we see. And that's all usually a long way away. And so when this thing happened in Westminster, It was just a reminder of how much work we have to do across the piece in challenging this, what I believe is probably the most serious threat in the 21st century. If this. Uh, the U.S. pulls out out of everywhere, yes, is it going to be the end of terrorism? It certainly would, would deny the terrorists the, the glue of unity. So as long as we're side by side with the, with the Saudis and with the Israelis, we're stuck in the Middle East and America will continue to bleed. Uh, and recognize that unless we do step, step forward, then these will become norms. The interference in elections, the interference in cyber attacks and so forth, the conduct of war is changing around us and further attacks in, in the UK could very well be inevitable. Um, and then You know, the common perception, the notion I had when I was in high school was that the Viet Cong terrorized the Vietnamese population, uh, forced them to fight against the Americans on the pain of death. What I began to understand in Vietnam was that they didn't need to do things like that. All they had to do was let a Marine patrol go through a village. And whatever was left of that village, they had all the recruits that they needed. Um, I began to understand why the Vietnamese didn't greet me with open arms, why they in fact hated me, but of course that didn't change the fact that, that my friends were getting killed and injured every day, and, and the only place that you could focus your own anger and fear was on those civilians who were there. And so it was this self-perpetuating mechanism. The longer that we stayed in Vietnam, the more Viet Cong there were, because we created them, we produced them. We are going through a very dangerous and volatile period and there is a big question for us when I think the nation as a whole has become a little risk averse as to what nations do stand up to uh, resurgent nations doing their own thing, to extremists, to non-state actors and I think that
series of services. Mm. But let's not also forget Jo Cox, you know, was killed uh, by an extremist too. And her plaque is actually inside the chamber itself that we all look at. So we're very conscious that we live in a very, very dangerous world. And it is up to us to work out what the strategy is, what is our posture that we're going to hold in order to be the exemplar to stand up for the values that we've spent decades in, 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 in millennia actually developing. Mm. That's what we need to remember, is not be defeated by these terrorists, but be positive and move forward. And that's the message that I told my son. I found him at the top of the stairs, he was refusing to go to bed, it was very late and uh, he wanted answers. He, he couldn't understand, firstly, why somebody had done something as, as, as terrible as this. And then he was also puzzled as to why I stepped forward into danger, as to why I stepped forward into danger to, to, to want to help. And uh, all I could suggest was that there are some very bad people in this world, but there are also some good people. and the good people do outnumber the bad people, and uh, we must stand up to these things. Just, I know you have uh, children yourself, and uh, the, sometimes it's when you have to describe something that's happened to you, or an experience, when you have to describe it to someone else, or, or to your children, that can be the, almost the, one of the hardest things, can't it, in terms of trying to explain something. What, how was that process for you? How have you tried to rationalise that or explain it to, to your children? I, the other uh, reflection and, and vivid image I have is returning home um, after what had happened and finding my, my son on the top of the stairs and, and he was in tears and he was just on his own. And, um, uh, I sat next to him and, and, uh, and he, he, he just asked why and I just said um, he couldn't understand why I'd stepped forward, why somebody had been killed, why somebody was yielding a knife in a place that he'd visited many times and, uh, and all I could offer was that you know there are some bad people in the world but there are a lot more good people and it's the good people that win. Mr. Alwood, I really appreciate you speaking to us this morning. I, um, I realise that, you know, these, this is very raw emotion still, and we very much appreciate you sharing some of that with us, and uh, clearly it'll be a hugely important day at Westminster today. So thank you for your time thank this you. morning. Just to say that the work that you do is, is so important, and that was reflected, that was reflected in the, 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 the day in March 23rd of, uh, of this year. In March 23rd of, uh, of this year. I very recall that, that day very vividly. It, it, it haunts me, it stays with me. In March 23rd of, uh, of this year. What I reflect on that day is actually what happened after that. I got home at about 10 o'clock in the evening and I have a little boy. Um, I have a little boy called Alex and uh, uh, he was at the top of the stairs. I came in and, and opened the doors and um, it was 10 o'clock in the evening and, and he didn't want to go to bed. He just wanted to make sure I was okay. And, Majority, we have two, two and a half million veterans in, in Britain. Majority make the transition into civilian life without a problem, but some do need support because of the horrific things that they've actually seen. Um, and it does remind me that I need to be conscious that uh, you know, I need to be aware of, 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 of what I've witnessed as well. Have you sought any help personally? No. no. Is that a conscious decision that you've taken? Uh, it's probably very typical of uh, a man uh, at an ex-army uh, and still in the reserves, so, uh, but I'm conscious that I should be aware of it. Absolutely. Uh, 
uh, at an ex-army uh, and still in the reserves, so, uh, but I'm conscious that I should be aware of it. And he asked this question, he said, why, Daddy, why, why did this happen? And I, I struggled with an answer. I just, all I could come up with is that there, there are some, some very bad people in this world, um, but there are more good people. And it's the good people that step forward. And I was fortunate that with my background and so forth, I was one of many many on that day that, that did step, step forward. First of all, just explain to us, so why were you at Westminster yesterday? Um, we were part of British Lionheart uh, boxing team who are about to take on I Italian Thunder tonight at York so Hall. I was, I was actually in Westminster for a meeting with um, some politicians about, about boxing. Um, what we normally do is we go and do a community activity um, PR event, which was taking place for an hour right. in, in the house. Mm. How, how's the comments? Mm. Uh, using boxing to engage young men. Um, this meeting had finished and we'd left. I was with uh, uh, an athlete called uh, John McAvoy. We walked into a new palace yard, which is the courtyard, and as we walked into the courtyard, we, the altercation occurred. Um, um, for about 90 seconds into it, another colleague, oh, sorry, not a colleague, another guy called Mike um, came and joined in. I um, also noticed that another uh, civilian in a tracksuit at the time um, moved towards the, uh, the casualty, the PC on the floor. Um, and then we commenced uh, first aid. Only later did I realise that the man in the tracksuit was uh, Staff Sergeant Davies, who was actually one of my uh, instructors at Sandhurst, where I did my training uh, when I joined the army nine years ago. GB boxing coach Tony Davies was leaving an event in the Commons when the attacker struck. He told me today his former army training kicked in, but so did a memory of Gunner Lee Rigby, murdered with a terrorist sword. The men served in the same unit. Um, we were part of British Lionheart uh, boxing team. So I was, I was actually in Westminster for a meeting with um, some politicians about, about boxing. Only later did I realise that the man in the tracksuit was uh, Staff Sergeant Davies, who was actually one of my uh, instructors at Sandhurst. Oh, Thank gosh. you. Well done. I'm going to take your hand for no. being so brave well well and, and amazing. Uh, 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 please, please, do, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not brave, I'm not a hero. No, you were there, you didn't run away. So I wouldn't really accept um, the tag of hero again. I think PC Palmer is the hero. All I could come up with is that there, there are some, some very bad people in this world, um, but there are more good people. And it's the good people that step forward. I was one of many, many on that day that, that did step, step forward and stood up to the terrorism and stood up to 
the terrorism. Please, please, the, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not brave, I'm not a hero. No, you were the And the horribleness that we, we saw intrude our lives that day. How did your mother cope knowing that she had lost a son to terrorism and then learning that another son was caught up in a terrorist attack here in London? She, um, I think she wasn't surprised that, uh, of, of my actions of, of, of the day. So I wouldn't really accept um, the tag of hero again, I think. And it's an honour to receive this award this evening and to be with others that step forward in your works of life to try and make our world a better place. I reacted in the way that I thought appropriate and I was one of many that stepped forward to do what we thought was right. I come from an army background and... There is a fraternity there where we look after each other, where there is a sense of bond and understanding. And I think what came home to me after the Westminster incident was just how close-knit your fraternity is. And just how, as was mentioned in that clip there, you don't know what's wrong. You really don't. And yet every day you put your uniform on and you stand in harm's way so we can continue our work. And that for me really came home with all the messages of thanks that I got. All the messages of thanks that I got. From across Britain and indeed wider afield. Of all saying, I don't know who you are, but it was one of us that you went to help and we very much appreciate that. And I'm just sorry I couldn't and those others with me couldn't do more to save Keith Palmer's life. He was also part of our community in Parliament as well. He had been working there many, many years. He had been working there many, many years. And day in, day out, we saw him and he works with his other colleagues. We were all as one. MPs, journalists and celebrities are amongst those who've shared the video, often with the faces of both boys clearly visible. The bullied child said today he felt ashamed of being online. It seems even when people share a video in support, the outcome may not be positive. The sharing is another form of um, abuse, in a sense, because it perpetuates the um, harm that was originally done to the child, um, and it makes it a permanent record of it, and it makes many more people to have seen and kind of, um, you know, so from the point of view of the aggression, the humiliation, the hurt, um, the problem is greatly perpetuated.
Well, earlier I spoke to the Defence Minister, Tobias Elwood. He last night tweeted out the video, writing, absolute disgrace, please retweet, saying the bully, his parents, the school and the onlookers had big questions to answer and apologising to the Syrian refugee, saying it's not the welcoming, friendly Britain we're supposed to be. I spoke to him and I started by asking him why he felt the need to retweet the video. Like so many, we were absolutely shocked by seeing these scenes and it raises big questions about understanding what our children, how are they're growing up today, about the difference between good and bad, and societally, where we should be going. Big questions, not just for all of us, for the school, for the parents, for our grandparents, and indeed, of course, for those who watch this event take place. And I worry that uh, we are becoming a walk-on by society where we're allowing space for these things to happen. We saw another event on the 17th of November where a female police officer was dragged across the ground. What did people do there? They laughed as they recorded it on social media. Cars drove by without stopping. That is absolutely wrong. It's that what I want to challenge. It's that what I, is what I want to change. But is that the right way to challenge it? It's two children, one's 16, one's 15, and their faces are all over social media. You're, you seem to be condoning this behaviour. This is absolutely wrong. I'm absolutely somebody not condoning, head -butting, condemning this behaviour. Headbutting, somebody headbutting another child. Where does this individual bully get these ideas from? That is the question that we all need to pose ourselves. Let, let me explain. My little boy went to school at preschool. Day one, he came back with a black eye. Day one, he came back with a black eye. And when I asked him how did he get this, he said he stepped in to defend his friend who was being beaten up by somebody else. My little boy went to school at preschool. My little boy went to school at preschool. Now, I can't tell any parent what they should do with their children. I can't anybody ask anybody what the conversations should be had. What I'm saying is that we should all ask ourselves, how is it that it's becoming the norm with social media to record these things, find them funny and amusing, and walk on by? That is the piece that I want to challenge, and that's what I was seeking to do by actually putting it out on social media myself. Publishing this video in this unredacted form shows an appalling want of good judgment, and I would also question the wisdom of showing the faces of minors in this forum. I mean, I think that's the point, isn't it? They're both children. Now, this is, you're reflecting the political, cor political correctness of where Britain, I fear, is heading towards. Not, I'm just Let's get about back children. and understand what our values are and defend them. Let's get back to being strong about what Britain should be. Let's get back to making sure that when kids grow up, they know the difference between good and bad, so this sort of thing doesn't happen. And you're also right to say that I hope the majority of us do not participate in this behaviour. That's actually a given. The point, though, is, is that the majority of it, Please let me that. finish. Please let me finish. If the majority of us walk on by, then we're actually 
taking, ignoring the situation. We're ignoring the problem. We need to own this problem. We need to get in front of this and solve this. And we can only do that if we move away from this walk on by society. Mr. Speaker, as we speak, bulldozers are flattening the village of Kananama and destroying its school, which was built with international donor support and which provides education to around 170 Bedouin children from five different communities. People who live in these villages threaten no one. Their crime is to have homes on land that Israel wants, to expand the illegal settlements of Kufa Adamin and Male Adamin. Speaking plainly, it is state-sponsored theft. More importantly, as the Minister has said, the forcible transfer of the villages of Kanan Alma and Abu Nawar contravenes international humanitarian law. It is a war crime. What other country would dare to behave in this barbaric way? And will the government condemn these actions in the strongest possible terms? The reality that this forceful eviction and demolition, this breach of international law, this hammer blow to the two-state solution is taking place as we sit here today. And we are all, frankly, tired of asking what can be done. This is the time for the United Kingdom to lead the major nations of the world in recognizing the Palestinian state and to do so immediately while there is still a state left to recognize. Mr. Elwood, you've been in the Middle East lately? Nice to see you, sir. Any comments on the... ...in Britain. In the 25 years I have spent in the House, and I suspect very much longer than that, no one can be the Minister for the Middle East in Britain if they are not a member, preferably a leading one, of either the Labour or Conservative Friends of Israel. It's the fact that you have to be a friend of Israel to be the Foreign Office Minister for the Middle East, which speaks volumes about the absolute unwillingness on the part of the British state, the British government, the British parliament to face up to its responsibility to the Palestinian people. It is the fact that in this building, the entire tragedy of the Palestinian people was authored when our foreign minister, then Mr. Balfour, promised on behalf of one people, a second people, the land which belonged to a third people, at a time when we didn't even possess the land of Palestine, even as an imperial possession. That is the original sin in Britain. All the blood that has flowed under the bridge since that declaration was made. And the fact that we don't recognize our special responsibility to the Palestinian people. On the contrary, you have to be a friend of Israel to be the minister for the Middle East. That is the Palestinian people, as a result of that declaration by Mr. Balfour, had their country wiped off the map. We hear a lot of talk in the Middle East about people threatening to wipe other people's countries off the map. But the only country that has been wiped off the map in the Middle East is Palestine. Go to your atlas, Miss Brooke, and you will see. The Palestinian people were scattered to the four corners of the earth, stateless, paperlessless, passportless, hunted from pillar to post, regularly subject to massacre and attack of one kind or another. And all of the responsibility for that originates here. Instead of recognizing that special responsibility, we do precisely the opposite. If you're not a known and celebrated supporter of the country which supplanted Palestine, drove the Palestinians out of their country into the four corners of the earth, then you have no chance to be the minister for the Middle East. I'm um, a minister in the Foreign Office and I spend much of my time looking after the Middle East and Africa, to the Middle East and Africa, to the Middle East and Africa. And
then to see PC Keith Farmer um, on the ground losing a lot of blood with officers trying to help, um, I simply moved forward uh, to see what I could do. We had a pulse. Um, the, it was clear that uh, I offered, I said I was trained as a medic and, and, and could I could I assist and and they said tell us what to do and I then the, the, as with all these situations your, your training kicks in and and uh, we did our best to try and stem the flow of, of bleeding and uh, cut back the uh, the flak jackets and so forth call for help get the medics in the medics asked me to continue working and then The helicopter arrived and uh, the doctors turned up as well and I was expecting him to be put in the helicopter and taken away but no you have to stabilize the body first. And I was again I was asked to continue. Um, I know that you were a captain in I think the Royal Green Jackets which is where your medical training had come from and I was reading at the weekend that you that you still feel now a year on you, you question whether or not there was anything more that you or others could have done, but, but the answer is no, isn't it? The ambulance service has a very different legal duty of care than, say, the police or fire and rescue service. For the ambulance service, the duty of care towards a patient is an established professional duty. Unlike the police and fire and rescue service, this duty engages from the point at which the ambulance service accepts a 999 call. Ambulance service, is the patient breathing? And is the patient conscious? OK, help is on its way. OK, there's just the two of us here right now. But... That duty is to provide a reasonable standard of care without unreasonable delay. To avoid liability, delays in accessing the patient and providing care need to be justified. Try and keep still, but there is help on the way, OK? To the ambulance service, it is in a position where it has to justify its, its, its duty of care towards a patient at each step of the way. The primary duty of care for the police and the fire and rescue services is to the public at large. However, the law has different expectations of the ambulance service, and this was set out in the key case of Kent versus Griffith in 2001. And I was reading at the weekend that you, that you still feel now, a year on, you, you question whether or not there was anything more that you or others could have done, but, but the answer is no, isn't it? This is a defibrillator. It can save someone's life, but only if you use it. A defibrillator is an easy to use device. You don't need any training to use it because it will tell you exactly what to do. Shock advised. Its job is to shock someone's heart back into a normal rhythm during cardiac arrest. However, it will only instruct you to deliver a shock if this is needed. When used with CPR, defibrillators give the best chance of survival.
Um, and it was very distraught then to, to find that, that much as everybody, everybody had worked so hard, um, that uh, we weren't able to keep him alive. There, there is that moment, isn't there, when someone has to call it. Uh, but you, you don't want to hear that, do you? You just want to continue on for as long as you possibly can. Eventually the doctor said, OK, I think we're just going to have to call it. And I, I remember looking at him and saying, you're going to have to tell me to stop, sir, because... Um, I, I, otherwise I'm going to keep doing this. And he just said, so you, you, you've done your best. We've all done our best here. Um, I call the time of death. As we handed over to the air doctors, there wasn't anything that we could do apart from trying to keep his head stable whilst they carry out um, what I can only describe as open heart surgery there, there and then. And, you know, I've not seen anything that graphic in my life. And it was at that point when the air doctor said, unfortunately, we've done all we can. We, we, we can't. We can't do anything more. That was it. It was like just a, a deep moment of sadness. I couldn't do any. I couldn't do. We couldn't do more to to help him. According to Masonic ritual, if you break your oaths, you f you will be murdered. That is that is the basic of the oath. Now, Masons will say, well. It's a joke, we don't murder people anymore. Well, the punishments become more bizarre from having your throat slit to having your, your, your chest open perpendicularly and your, your, your lights thrown over your shoulder and to having your, your, your chest open perpendicularly and your, your, your lights thrown over your shoulder and buried in the sands. And In fact, the Masonic Oath guarantees a gruesome death for those who reveal the secrets. I do promise and swear under no less penalty than to have my breast torn open, my heart and vitals taken from thence and exposed to rot on the dunghill. One of whom explained how the criminal could buy immunity to commit crime all over London. And the phrase that he used, that the officer used, was I'm a member of a little firm within a firm the implications of that, that there was a secret society, uh, a tight-knit group of police officers who dealt amongst themselves and who could guarantee immunity for criminals around the whole of the metropolitan area. That phrase gave a, a depth and a ring to what was to become a major corruption scandal. The officer who talked of the firm in a firm was Freemason John Simons. When the story was published, he was charged with soliciting a £50 bribe and suspended. While not denying his part in the corruption of the time, he claims the actual charge was absurd. Faced with what he saw as a fit-up, he sent word to the officers probing the allegations that if jailed, he would expose many other corrupt detectives. The chief investigator was a Freemason, Superintendent Bill Moody, then head of London's obscene publication squad. I sent a message to Moody through another Freemason saying that um, I, I, I wouldn't stand for the, the fit up. I knew what was going on. And uh, unless he stopped doing what he was doing, I intended to expose everything that I knew about metropolitan police, corruption, Freemasonry, its involvement in corruption, himself and uh, the um, porn, porn squad, which I knew, I knew about. In threatening to expose his brother Masons, Simons was only too aware of the traditional punishment awaiting Masonic traitors, being cut in half. The penal sign is given by drawing the hand smartly across the body. The threat is perhaps symbolic.
questioning. So critical thought uh, is, is actually uh, going to prevent any extremist from getting into your head uh, to be able to make you believe that it's a worthy cause to kill other people. That is, in my view, uh, what is a generational challenge that we now face. It shows a courier on a motorcycle entering the parliamentary estate, looking around for any police officers, but not initially finding. Some of his colleagues came, gathered drums, saying, it's Keith, it's Keith. And that's when I've gone to him, Keith, come on, so stay with us, come on, there's help on its way. Plain clothes, uh, police officers, ambulances, uh, police dogs as well, and uh, a serious incident fire, um, fire brigade unit as well. So, yeah, the police operation has massively stepped up. And actually, uh, the longer we got after the incident, the further and further away the cordon was pushed. And that's why we are now about 300 metres away from the Palace of Westminster. And it is, you know, there are flashing blue lights behind us, but it is some distance now that we are from uh, the Palace of Westminster and where this incident happened. And, and as I was saying, that Tobias Elwood, the junior minister in the, in the Foreign Office, the fact he was so closely involved trying to save the life of this policeman just shows you know, this was really the heart of Westminster. That's right. I mean, Westminster is the centre of London, if you like. There are always lots of tourists here. It's a key spot to have your photograph taken, but it's also incredibly busy because of where it is. Right That's right. I mean, Westminster is the centre of London, if you like. There are always lots of tourists here. It's a key spot to have your photograph taken, but it's also incredibly busy because of where it is, right in the centre of Westminster. There's always masses of traffic. But inside the palace, too, you don't just have MPs and peers. Remember, there are hundreds of people who help to keep this place going. There's uh, people who look after the, the kitchens and the cleaners. To the, the kitchens and the cleaners. To the, the kitchens and the cleaners. To the, the kitchens and the cleaners. Uh, and everybody it, it works closely together inside the palace.